Blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross. Who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. I am as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. 
They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am poor and no man, sworn by all despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver you, let him rescue you. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been trusted to you ever since I was born. You are my God, and I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through the flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and with our hearts clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May remain seated for the Passion Gospel. Please stand at the place of the skull, and we will pause at the death of Jesus. Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom he gave you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? 
So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciples, who was known to be the, the high priest, went out, spoke to a woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. When the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teachers, Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Are those who heard what I said to them? They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas went to him bound to, and him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing with warming himself. They asked him, You are also not one of his disciples, are you? Peter denied again and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, he would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill, fulfill what Jesus had said when he had the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom is <laughs> from this world. My followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that if I release someone for you at Passover, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted and replied, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned, and Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. <coughs> they kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. 
The Jews answered again answered him. We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his quarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bed at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to, Jew, to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription because the place there Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to the Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture said. They divided my clothes among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciples, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciples took her into their own home. After this, when Jesus knew all that was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill this scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing him. So he put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Especially because that Sabbath was the day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have his legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first of the two who had been crucified. Him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, 
and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so, that it can also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on one whom they have cursed. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was the disciple of Jesus, thought the secret coin because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to <coughs> take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him position, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was empty, they laid Jesus there. his closest friends. I promised last Sunday when I compared the different gospel messages of the Passion that on Good Friday I would address the Gospel of John. John's version of the Passion is used in all three of our lectionary years exclusively on Good Friday. John, writing in the early 2nd century, offers a more complete vision of royalty 
than even Matthew does. For John, Christ's royalty is tangible and real. It is here and now. It is true divinity dwelling among us. God's Word, capital W, His one true and only Son, comes into the world, becomes flesh, and dies a human death. Yet, there is a strong sense of glory, even joy, because there is hope. John's message is clear throughout his entire gospel that Jesus is the divine Son of God. This contrasts greatly with the veiled secrecy that we see in Mark. John's portrayal of Jesus as true divinity differs from the other evangelists. Jesus is in control throughout the entire passion narrative. He is fulfilling his destiny according to God's master plan, even while enduring a harsh death by crucifixion. It is in the Gospel of John that Jesus utters his last words of, It is finished. For the pre-Easter Jesus, it was finished. The cruel, humiliating, and painful death that he had endured was now over. The ultimate sacrifice had finally come to an end. But what was Jesus saying with these, his last words? Various biblical translations may offer slight differences of, it is consummated, it is accomplished, it is achieved, it is finished. What is finished? What is finished? is it. Is Jesus speaking of his life on earth? Because it was finished. Is that what it is? No. Jesus is speaking of something entirely different, brought about by that precious sacrificial death. Jesus is speaking of your salvation and mine. It is now secure. It is completed. We have been saved by that one beautiful and supremely unselfish act. There is no greater thing that a man can do for his friends than to lay down his life. This is what Jesus taught the disciples and what he is teaching us. Jesus dies on a cross for our sins, and we are all asked to do something. All we have to do is pick up our own cross and follow him. The service of Good Friday, as it appears in our Book of Common Prayer, consists of three parts. The liturgy of the Word, the veneration of the cross, and Holy Communion from the Reserved Sacrament. Today, we remember that awesome symbol of our salvation, the cross. Let us take a moment just to look at some different crosses and their different devotional applications. Medieval crosses, often depicting the suffering of Christ, there are plain crosses, sometimes they're made out of metal. Wooden crosses, some of which are adorned with a corpus Christi, the body of Christ hanging on the cross, such as that one, or the one on the wall in the parish hall. These are typically not shrouded or removed from the church. Why is that? The body of Jesus is a constant reminder of the agony of his death on the cross. There are various triumphant versions of the cross, elaborate crosses, 
covered throughout Lent, removed for today. They're simply too pretty, not real enough, not painful enough. Dare we assume that on a day like today, we represent cheap grace? There are those that are encrusted with jewels, the Christmas Rex that shows Christ in magnificence on the cross. There's even a scene depicting Jesus coming down from the cross in triumph. Very post Vatican II, Roman Catholic. No matter what kind of cross it is, they're all powerful. A priest who you know very well, who was my spiritual advisor in seminary, used to like to define sanctification as ever crawling towards the cross. It is customary to venerate the cross in some fashion today. When we have sung the anthems and the solemn collects are over, the wooden cross will be brought in to the words of, this is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. To which we respond, Come, let us worship. These verse rules and responses are in your bulletin. You don't have to memorize them. The deacon does. After the cross is stationed in front of the altar, all will be invited to come forward. There are many traditions and differing ways to venerate the cross, and the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer make provisions for any and all. You may simply kneel or sit in your pew and prayerfully consider Jesus' death on the cross. Some may choose to genuflect three times as they approach this awesome symbol of the power of Christ. Some may even elect to prostrate themselves. I used to. You may as is the custom of the sun. Kiss the cross. Don't be overly concerned health-wise. In a more modern-day custom, the deacon will wipe the cross off with hand sanitizer so you don't get sick. And while this is occurring, our choral voices will be singing the hymn Stata Mata Dolorosa. The dramatic song of Mary keeping vigil over the cross and her dying son. Whatever you choose to do, please do not feel pressured to do anything you're not comfortable doing. But do please take a moment to contemplate not only the humiliation of such a death, but also the awesome power of the redemptive work of Jesus as he dies for our sins so that we may live. The final part of the service is the Holy Eucharist reserved overnight in the chapel at the altar of repose, consecrated yesterday in the Monty Thursday service. On this day, the only day in the church year on which the Holy Eucharist cannot be celebrated in its full and complete form. There will be no words of institution, no emphasis, another Greek word, when the priest, God's minister, invokes the power of the Holy Spirit to change the very substance of the bread and the wine to contain within themselves all sweetness, the presence of Christ. There will be none of this because this is good right.
said before me, as is your custom for the solemn cause. Dear people of God, all Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with Him for everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for the people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray with the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service for all bishops and other ministers, and for the people who may serve. For that who are bishop and other people of the diocese and standing community, for all Christians in this community, for those who are about to be baptized. That God will confirm this church in faith, increase its love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and is sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them, for Joe, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth, and live in peace and concord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Let us pray for all who have received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, or contemptuous and scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to truth and lead them to faith and obedience.
Come, let us adore him.
and precious blood has redeemed us. Save us and help us to be humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.